everyone. I'm Vita Kakati Shah, your host for The Uma Show. Welcome to your one-stop journey for feeling empowered. We're a platform for change. We build confidence. We are your voice. We want you to be bold, be you, be Uma. Today, we're exploring women in diversity and inclusion. And I'm so excited to be joined by a goddess of go-getting, Sharmishta Chatterjee Banerjee, who is joining us from the Netherlands. And she is the policy director, internationalization at Radboud University's Nijmegen School of Management. Welcome, Sharmishta. Thank you so much, Rita. Delighted to be here. So tell us, you're a girl from Kolkata originally. Tell us about your upbringing and how you grew up. So yes, very much and from Kolkata and very proud to be from Kolkata. So I grew up as part of a very large joint family. So our house in Kolkata is actually uh, five addresses into one, one of the very few still standing on a main road and, uh, you know, very few people living there at the moment, but I grew up in a bustling household. Uh, my grandfather, you know, who was the patriarch of the family, a very eminent lawyer, uh, who taught us, you know, very much so that, you know, work, professional life must be balanced with, you know, family life, values, and integrity and honesty above all, even if that meant, you know, having a little bit less than others. Right. Um, I went to school at, uh, so to Loretto House, which is again, very much, uh, you know, it's a convent, an Irish convent, very value-led, value-driven. Uh, my dad, one of the most hardworking men that I've seen, for whom, again, you know, it was very important to be loyal to his employer, even if that meant, you know, going to um, evacuate very many Indians from, uh, from Kuwait during the Gulf War. Wow. Uh, my mum, you know, convent educated again, but adjusted to the norms of a very traditional, but, you know, liberal thinking, uh, joint family. Uh, so, yeah, so that's that's how I grew up. And, uh, you know, very, very, quite, quite fortunate to have yeah. grown up in such, a, you know, in, in such a big family, to be honest, where you learned bits from everybody. I can imagine. It sounds like you've got that really, really close knit bond. Um, you have certainly with your parents and your value system. So I really, really love that. Um, so walk us a little bit through your education. Um, you did a BA in political science and international relations from the Jadav University in India to becoming an alumna of the University of California's W30 leadership program. Yeah, um, to be honest, Rita, you know, my life and my career, you know, you could actually call it, you know, a bit sort of like not so planned, but something <laughs> that happened serendipitously. So, you know, as my mentor, who is the vice chancellor, deputy vice chancellor of Newcastle University says, you know, it's, it's not important always to have a plan. And, you know, you must think about, you know, what are the stretch opportunities, rather than always thinking about the ladders. And when she told me that, I thought, well, does she know what I actually have done with myself? Or is it is it something that, you know, she She's just talking about from her experience of where she is. So, yeah, so I did a degree in uh, an honors degree in political science and uh, international relations from Jadavpur University. Again, you know, one of the best in Calcutta and certainly in India now, you know, very much recognized in the world as well. And from there, um, while still doing my master's, I uh, started working for Jet Airways in what would be considered a graduate job in, in mm -hmm. today's world. Yeah. And uh, it was, you know, sort of like launching at that time. Gosh, I'm revealing my age here, of course, but uh, as, as India's, you know, top private airline. And uh, it was great to work there, to learn. You know, my father worked for Air India, so it was very much sort of, you know, getting that experience of what he did, what his world was all about. And, uh, you know, a year and a half into that, I got married. So I moved to Netherlands with my husband wow. uh, and there, you know, uh, because of, you know, ev every every issue that every immigrant faces around uh, work permits, etc. I wasn't able to work, but I spent a lot of time uh, devoting to my dance. I am an Indian classical dancer, so I performed in many shows um, in the Netherlands. And then we moved to Belgium. 
and then from Belgium to Belfast in the Northern Ireland, where wow. I gave birth to my son. So, mm -hmm. and that's when I consciously actually decided that I did not want to seek opportunities to work or to study because I wanted to devote my time to him. I wanted to experience motherhood, see yeah. what it's like, and also obviously ensure that he had, you know, good start to life. And uh, and so so I didn't work for uh, until he was about 16 months old. And from there, I then, uh, you know, faced um, that uh, the challenge that, again, I think most immigrants face, which is when you go out with a degree that you think that you have done, you have excelled in, but isn't recognized in that part of the world where you now reside. So it was almost impossible to find the right opportunity. I had gaps in my CV. I had gaps, you know, not that much of work experience. Um, so at that point, I found an opportunity funded by the government, which was to get people back into work, which was in e-commerce. So I did a certification course in that and found an opportunity with the global email company. And whilst, you know, many people rejected that offer to work with them, I thought it was the best offer in the world because <laughs> it was something that helped me to work evenings and, uh, and nights, which meant I had all the time in the world during the day with my son. But a few months into that job, we moved again. <laughs> Yeah, and this time that. to Southampton. And wow. uh, here, actually, you know, my travel experience came in really handy. So I landed up in a marketing role with Cunard, mm -hmm. the uh, cruise brand, yeah. and worked with them for a couple of years, you know, developing my marketing and branding skills as part of the rebranding project. And then from there, what happened is um, I saw this advert from the Higher Education Founding yeah. Council, and they were uh, wanting professional marketers to come into higher education as professionals. But in return, they were going to fund me to do my master's. Amazing. So <laughs> there was quite a lot of competition, as you can imagine, but I managed to get that position. So the day my son started reception, which is kindergarten, uh, in, in um, school, I also went back to school to do my master's. So worked in higher education marketing, completed my master's um, from Nottingham Business School. And then from there, I um, went into my first proper higher education job mm -hmm. at Newcastle University, yeah. where, you know, after a few years climbing the ranks, they sent me, Newcastle University is a really good investor in people. And yeah. they sent me to do the W30 program at uh, UCLA. So that was quite a long winded answer to your what? question Around but I had to take you through the journey <laughs> amazing so there we go that's quite an amazing journey that you've had and you've actually gained much recognition in your work in the diversity and inclusion space such as receiving the Asian Women Enterprising Award from Asian Business Connections ABC in the UK and that was back in 2019 you've also been nominated but for the DNI Award by the Institute of Directors and recently been recognized as one of the most influential South Asians of 2020. I mean, congratulations. Tell us a bit, a little bit about what first inspired your passion for diversity and inclusion initiatives. Thank you, Rita. Um, yes, the 2020 influential list really threw me off my God and by surprise, totally. But, you know, felt very humbled by it, of course, and honoured to be in the in the company of such inspirational people. But, um, yeah, I mean, I could say that, you know, it is, it is uh, probably my career in higher education, which led to my conscious realization of the lack of inclusion within the higher education space. So when you look at you know, universities world worldwide, particularly I'm talking about the Western world and the sort of you know, conspicuous gap in terms of presidents and vice chancellors, particularly if you look at Europe, um, in, in terms of you know, black or brown people of color, assuming um, 
positions of responsibility and uh, honor at, at universities. Mm. And um, this, my, my personal experience wasn't very different either. So when I joined Newcastle in a group of um, 60 professionals, just within the business school where I worked, and I'm not talking about the academic staff, I was actually the only person of color. And this is not conscious, you know, this is this is uh, not that people weren't, you know, people were being consciously excluded, but it's just that unless you are, you know, in the in in the space where you see others like you, yeah, it's very difficult to be on your own. Mm. And uh, one thing led to another, and then it, it led me to sort of like, you know, question the why, you know, right. why is it? that we don't see so many people uh, mm -hmm. who look like me, who talk like me, who are from, might be from a different country, but might be from the UK as well in the space. Yeah. And when you look at the statistics and the demographics, it's, it's not always true that these regions are, uh, have, have those demographic gaps. Yeah. So it was more a case of like, is, is it complacence? Is it ignorance? Is it the lack of training? Is it the lack mm -hmm. of ambition? And that led me to, to really think about and to consciously plan how we can try to close the, this, this sort of gap. Yeah. To which, you know, of course, Newcastle University was very supportive, particularly working with my mentor, Professor Sanders. You know, mm -hmm. I managed to do uh, a few things in this space. But yeah. if I'm being totally honest, Rita, did, did it really start actually from my job perspective? And this is what, you know, kind of led me to question myself. And I thought, no, actually not. You know, it started maybe inadvertently. I was asking the whys right from my childhood, you know. So being a not so fair girl, <laughs> you know, the, the amount of times you're told that, uh, you know, you should try skin lightening products, you know, at mm -hmm. home the malai the the cream on your face and the turmeric yeah. on your face to to sometimes sort of being excluded by a great aunt which I could fortunately laugh at you know <laughs> but uh from from dinner invitations to you know again people sort of after I got married saying to me how how much more fair my husband was from me wow. <laughs> so, you know made me actually think about inclusion in a very different space and that we we as Asians have to do a lot a lot in our own backyards before we can actually go and question the world. Yeah, you're so right about that because a lot of it is cultural and you're to your point I mean you've been in the diverse inclusion space now for quite a while and a complete advocate for that space but I think I love mm -hmm. the fact that you've had that personal background and the cultural background as well because it isn't just you know opportunities that's one part but if you've come from that and you've felt it yourself and you've seen it where you know your own family friends or your own communities are seeing things a certain way that's the crux of part of the issue there in itself you know, the underlying issue. So I love the fact that you're kind of actually trying to look at some of that um, to try and address it as well. Absolutely. I mean, if you actually think about it, you know, we're all thinking about Black Lives Matter, but how many of us, and I'm talking particularly about Asians, actually, you know, we're, we're always out to, you know, we, we're very ready to say that um, we have been treated not so well, but how do we treat others? Yeah. You know, where is it? Are we prepared to have those conversations about what equality and equity really mean? And yeah. are we are we prepared to actually stand up for others? So yeah. so I, I think, you know, it's it's very important that we question ourselves first about inclusion before we go out to set the world right. Absolutely. It's our own value systems. You've just hit the nail on the head there. It's about who we are, how we've been brought up. And it's those biases that we all naturally have. And how does that impact how we address other people in the way we think as well? So I love the fact that you've actually said that as well, because it's recognizing what makes up who we are as well. Um, so you've obviously been in this space for a while and you've also pivoted to diversity inclusion in more ways than one. You mentioned that you are a trained classical Indian dancer and that you actually choreograph and perform pieces that drive inclusion. So tell us a bit about that. 
So that is totally, Rita, that's, that's totally inspired by uh, Tagore and Tagore's, mm -hmm. you know, philosophy around inclusion. You yeah. know, the, the whole, whole sort, you know, sort of uh, ethos around the fact that inclusion must exist in its true form, whether that's physical, whether that's spiritual, whether that's in education stems from that. So mm -hmm. what I have been doing is um, choreographing a lot of Tagore's work. So when you think about gender and you think about his works, such as Shama, such as uh, Sharp Mochun, you see you see women being in power, women making the choices, women, you know, showing their vulnerabilities, yeah. women being able to accept that they make mistakes. And so they are in a position to rectify them and 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 move forward. When you look at Chandalika, you see the whole concept of untouchability, where you know societal norms are basically, and, and this is something written centuries ago. So you know, where where he is basically saying, look, you know, for an equitable society changes are very important and these are things that the western world probably does not know about yeah. you know when 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 they think about developing countries they think about you know asia you feel that everybody's repressed mm -hmm. and that's not the case so through my dance I, what my message has been is very much around, you know, look, you know, these philosophies, these ideas have existed, they have been practiced. It exists in Indian societies as well. And, mm -hmm. and not just that the West has a lot to give to the East, but the East also has a lot to give to the West. Absolutely. And that's, and that's, you know, how I how I started uh, translating and uh, presenting the works in English. Absolutely. And I think that's beautiful. I mean, the, the work of Rabindranath Tagore anyway is just so incredible. And I think to your point, I mean, I've often quoted um, little pieces of the English translated versions in some of the talks I've done as well. And I think mm -hmm. exactly to your point, there is so much in Eastern philosophy that you can totally take and use in different walks of life around the world. Um, so I love that. So um, now talk to us a little bit about your current role as policy director of internationalization, Radbout University's Nijmegen School of Management. So um, my role is a strategic role. So Nijmegen School of Management is basically, uh, it's, it's a very interdisciplinary faculty. So that's what attracted me to the role because in most business school senses, you think about economics, management and accounting. But this school is very much about, you know, bringing the interdisciplinary forces from economics, from management, but also from human geography, from politics and from mm -hmm. public administration right. into creating business education that can influence societal challenges and 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 governance around it so and this is where you know the school is based in Netherlands it's actually one of the it's it's the top university in terms of student experience a very research intensive university but they want to take their work more global so I was headhunted for it and um, and uh, it was in the midst of lockdown actually <laughs> so <laughs> everything was online and and I I managed to you know they they offered me the job and then came the dilemma of you know whether I take it whether I whether I don't take it and, you know it, it's 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 all those things with relocation, etc. But the role involves me influencing, looking at their internationalization strategy across the piece, the research, student experience, education, uh, how the school engages with the corporate world, and how we develop students who become responsible managers mm -hmm. in at truly global graduates. So are they really take you know ready? to be globalized enough to uh, deal with the future of work. Absolutely, and very, very important work right there. Um, you've also talked in the past about the importance of equal partnership when it comes to professional and your personal life as well. Um, tell us a little bit about that. 
So, Rita, I think, you know, when people talk about, uh, you know, equal partnership, they, mm-hmm. they think about, you know, particularly in a, in a family situation, they think about chemistry, you know, earning the money, mm-hmm. uh, you know, gender fluidity, who does what chores. And I just think it's about mindset. It's about, you know, knowing each other and being there, not only for each other, but also being able to encourage and almost mobilize each other's potentials. And, You know, again, if you see my career, I'm not so sure I would be here if it hadn't been uh, for my husband and my family being behind me in all of this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even with this job at Nijmegen, it was, you know, my son telling me that this was now my turn to do what I wanted. And he's only 21. You know, that makes a difference. And that's that's where I think it's a real leveler. Your family has to be the real leveler when it comes to um, comes to your professional and your personal fulfillment. And that's where I feel that, you know, it, it is an equal partnership. We all have our roles to play. And it is about being able to really think about and like what that person you yeah. know would 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 think about so i mean if um to really be able to walk in that person's shoes really and think about you know what would i do if i were in their position absolutely and i think to 100 percent agree with your point there i think you know everybody does need that support network as you've said but also in in your household you need to share out and be able to communicate um, and let other each other know what's going on so you can actually be and form that partnership as well. Whether in my case, it's like homeschooling or pick up and drop off, whatever it is, it's the same kind of thing. It needs to work on a partnership for it to be successful. So I, I really kind of admire the fact that you that is your policy and that is how you run it. And your son actually tells you to, you know, go out and get your <laughs> I love that. It's amazing stuff. Um, absolutely I think I think for all of us you know who are and I know that you do as well you live away from family you've chosen to go to New York and uh, you know for all all of us who haven't got that family support you know that is really important you raise your children you're you're focusing on your career you want to come back into you know do things you're always feeling a little bit guilty somewhere that you're not doing the right thing so I think without that family support you know and as I said it's not about just you know for me it's not just about the chores it's about you know being there to push me a lot because I could be so complacent I could just say oh well you know even with this job it was like oh well I got it but so what yeah. I don't think I can do it and you know somebody pushing you to say no you should do it because There's these no opportunities don't yeah. come mm. and that's that's where I, I really feel that you know that equal partnership is really important absolutely absolutely yeah and that is a challenge to many as well I guess you know mm-hmm. um Along your years and your career, um, there must have been some challenges that you felt along the way. Um, could you share any with us and perhaps how you sort of uh, came about them? Sure. I mean, as I've spoken about a few things, you know, being being the only brown face doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I've been treated unfairly or anything, but it is, it is, you know, every time your name, you know, is, and I was very, very firm from the beginning that I, my name has to be pronounced exactly in the way it is. A few iterations here and there is fine, but yeah. no, you know, if I can say Kiva to somebody who spells their name as C-A-I-O-M-H-E, then Shamishta is, is, is possible. <laughs> so, so, I mean, to that point, I don't think, I faced any challenges that any uh, immigrant woman or any other woman wouldn't have faced in their careers where you're trying to, you know, kind of balance family, career, you know, trying to make your make your way through the career ladder, trying to see, trying to almost find yourself because, you know, I started, I, I started out quite young in my career, but then I had a career break and, yeah. you know, with children and with, with, with my child coming in and then, you know, family issues, etc. So that's, that's where I feel that those are challenges everybody faces. So my yeah. challenge, Rita, has been more with myself. So mm-hmm. it's more yeah. about, you know, about how how do I become more resilient? You know, mm-hmm. uh, how do I stop taking things more personally? Yeah. So, you know, so if somebody says something to me, whether that's personally or whether that's professionally, you know, I used yeah. to fester a lot around it. Or why did that happen? Mm-hmm. Uh, what do I do? 
how do I change that? How do I, you know, w- what should I, what should I have done? Why, why, yeah. why, why? And that's, that's something a lot of women do. And mm. that is a challenge that I've overcome by thinking about, look, you know, that's happened. And to be resilient, I have to be more kind to myself. So yes, it's happened. It's not yeah. going to happen again. It's a mistake. We all make mistakes. I've got to learn from it. And I've got to make sure that I deal with it so that it never happens again. And in that, I've got to look after myself because if I don't look after myself, I can't really look after others. Yeah. And that's so I think- quite, yeah, right there. Because to your point, you know, um, things happen. Um, and you know we can't obviously control some of the things that happen but what we can control we are in charge of is our reaction and what we do to do something about a situation and it's really a mindset thing it's about having that confidence and communicating to your point and building up that resilience to do that you know to say that okay fine I might be the only person here or you know for me personally um, Shamishta when I moved to the US my name very simple Rita but in Mm. the US it's pronounced Rita and I'm like yes I know I do like to read books and all that but so little things like that I would just correct people and I still do like oh yeah it's actually return and I do it politely but that's my thing and I used to be embarrassed about it now I'm like you know it's just that's my name you know that's who I am so pronounce it correctly so I think it's those little sort of nuggets that really help stem stem people forward really before we let you go what words of wisdom would you give to any sort of young girls out there who kind of want to follow your footsteps and wanted to get into that diversity and inclusion space I just want to say, you know, be your authentic self. So, you know, don't seek endorsements all the time. I think we spend a lifetime seeking endorsements, whether that's from family, friends, employers, you know, our professional careers. Do what you want to do. You have one life to lead. And, you know, be Uma. And and be a go-getter. Do what you want to do. Achieve that. And it's not the end of the world if you don't achieve it either. It's fine. As long as you know you've tried, it's good enough. And it's it's not it's not something that you have to continue to do all your life. You can change your path as many times as you want. Very, very, very well said. Thank you so much, Shamishta, for sharing your inspiring journey with us today. Shamishta Chatterjee Banerjee, Policy Director, Internationalization at Radford University's Nagmarian School of Management. And thank you to our viewers for joining us on this empowerment journey today. We want you all to embrace that inner goddess of go-getting. We want you to be bold, be you, be Uma.